Thank you, Mike. Uh, you've stolen most of my thunder. I think I should just sit down. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rogers, for making us uh, very welcome into your house. And uh, thank you, Mancunians, for uh, making me very welcome to your city. I'd like to start with uh, an acknowledgement uh, to country, uh, which probably needs a, a little bit of explanation. Um, acknowledgement country is a, is a custom in, in my country to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and um, certainly the Aboriginals and the Torres Strait Islanders have been the custodians of our country for some uh, 40,000 years, whereas the rest of us have only been there for the last 300 years. So uh, I had to do some research uh, about uh, Manchester to try and identify who were the traditional owners of, of Manchester. Uh, the best I could do, and it was extensive research, about five minutes of Googling, was I identified the Briganti tribe, who were, who were a Celtic tribe, who occupied the territory prior to the Roman invasion in uh, 70 AD. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Briganti people, who are the traditional cus uh, custodians of this land, and I'd like to pay respect to their elders, past and present, and the uh, elders of the Celtic nation. I extend my respect to other Celtic people present. So there is a reason that uh, I chose to start with an acknowledgement to country, because I think it uh, highlights uh, the importance of identity. And certainly uh, identity underpins many issues of conflict. Uh, what is our identity? You know, it, uh, certainly. Uh, it encapsulates uh, our traditions, our values, our, our religion, uh, our spirituality, our families, our history and our purpose. So it's often challenges to our identity that result or underpin conflict, particularly conflict that we're prepared to go to war, die or risk injury for. So, oh, there's a lot of gizmos here. So why does a, a cop stand here before you're talking about peace? I think that's a pretty good question, pretty good place to start. If you look at uh, dysfunctional security sector, dysfunctional police organisations, um, they're often the oppressors, uh, often the strong arm of, of errant regimes, often met out untried justice, which I suggest to you is, a, is an oxymoron, and often corrupt and prejudicial in their application of the law. If you look at the functional security sector, functional police, uh, they take an oath of office to serve the community, to serve the people. Uh, they are governed by their oath of office, uh, and the oath of office creates a separation of powers between government and their responsibilities uh, to the oath of office of constable. We're the custodians of human rights, uh, and we're altruistically motivated to care for our community. So. I'd like to put myself in the second category of police officers, if you don't mind, and <laughs> hence why I stand here before you. So, also, um, I had the privilege of being a, a Rotary uh, International Peace Fellow. I'm not sure if there's any Rotarians in, in the audience. Fantastic. So, uh, and the International Peace Fellowship is a professional development opportunity that brings together peace workers from around the world, and it, it targets uh, mid-career peace workers. And uh, the idea is to, to pull them out of uh, their, their day jobs, skill them up, uh, top up their toolbox uh, with uh, uh, peace tools. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, use some anecdotes to talk about the application of some of, of those peace tools. And what is a peace worker? It's a somewhat problematic term, but uh, you can hear in this uh, picture behind you, uh, you can see that our group of peace workers uh, was very diverse. And there were UN workers uh, dealing with uh, policy development and uh, peace strategies on the world stage. Uh, Red Cross workers involved in, in aid projects. Uh, academics dealing with uh, uh, skilling up our, our future peace workers. Uh, teachers dealing with schoolyard uh, bullying and cyber uh, bullying, NGO workers working in uh, the post-conflict recovery space, uh, journalists with an interest in, in peace journalism. Uh, there was also a charity worker from an organisation called Charisma, D 
dealing with uh, community conflict in a place called Mosside in Manchester, uh, and also a cop uh, from dealing with uh, community conflict uh, in Greater Dandenong in Australia. So Greater Dandenong, City of Greater Dandenong. So my role uh, is the local area commander for, or the, for the City of Greater Dandenong. Uh, so fairly simple task. I've got some 250 cops and have to deliver policing services to the City of Greater Dandenong. Greater Dandenong is, a, is an interesting place uh, where uh, about 140,000 uh, people. Um, what is significant about uh, Dandenong, it is the most uh, culturally diverse community in all of Australia. There's 156 recognised settled uh, cultures. 56% of uh, the residents in Greater Dandenong are born overseas. 51% uh, come from non-English speaking backgrounds. Uh, some 70,000 are employed locally. Uh, Greater Dandenong has a heavy and medium uh, uh, industry, and so there are opportunities for low and semi-skilled employment in a large manufacturing sector. Uh, there's also availability of low-cost accommodation, uh, and uh, Greater Dandenong is on the first decile of uh, the CFIA index, which is a measure for social disadvantage in in our country. And the first decile is not winning the race, by the way. That's uh, the wrong end of the spectrum. Uh, we have an over-representation of unemployment compared to the national and state average. 25% uh, of our population are young people. Uh, once again, an over-representation compared to the national and state average. Uh, youth unemployment up on average, uh, crime per capita up on average, and perceptions of safety lower than average. So some, some significant challenges uh, for a police officer. So as I said, uh, Greater Dandenong is uh, very costly diverse uh, and is also a location, a preferred location for settlement of uh, emerging communities. Remembering that uh, it was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have occupied uh, Australia for the past uh, 40,000 years, and it's only the last 200 years plus uh, that the rest of us have been there. So I take the view that uh, we're all immigrants, refugees, uh, and very recent arrivals. Personally, my, my cultural heritage, which I acknowledge, uh, my uh, maternal, sorry, maternal grandparents uh, were both from Estonia and escaped uh, uh, Stalin's regime after they were sent to Siberia to, to farm, which is a pretty tough task given the, uh, the ground is frozen most of the time. So they had the resources to, to escape. Uh, my grandmother, uh, paternal grandmother, was uh, Italian, uh, Maria uh, Perononi, and my father, uh, grandfather, was a first generation Australian born of, of English parents. So I've got a lot of cultural acknowledging to do. So Danong has uh, long been a location of settlement, uh, and this place uh, is why. It's the Enterprise Hostel. The Enterprise Hostel opened in the 1970s and closed down in 1992. It was the first home in Australia for some uh, 30,000 uh, immigrants and, and refugees, and it's seen waves of, of, of refugees uh, from England, uh, also from Manchester, and there could be people here that have uh, uh, relatives or, or friends who have resettled in Australia who may have started their Australian existence in, in this very hostile. Uh, it's seen waves from southern, northern and uh, eastern Europe. It's seen waves of uh, uh, settlement from, from Asia, particularly uh, Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, and it closed down, as I said, uh, because the, the settlement model changed, and the settlement model is now within the community as it should be, as, as opposed to cloistered uh, uh, in a hostel such as this. Okay, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, football, or soccer as we call it. I just noticed about a quarter of uh, the audience shuffle forward in their seats. <laughs> Here we go. So. Um, Football, or soccer as we call it, is, is not the, uh, uh, the predominant uh, sport in our country. 
uh, Australian real football, uh, rugby, cricket enjoy a larger following. However, there is a large following uh, for football uh, and a growing following for football. Uh, the supporter base is particularly strong uh, amongst uh, European diaspora, and many Melbourne suburban, suburban clubs have a particular supporter base uh, and player base that is, uh, favours a specific ethnicity. So this is interesting. It uh, creates uh, different layers at football matches, and we often see conflict break out amongst supporters and sometimes players on the field due to deep-seated, unresolved conflicts uh, uh, from the past. It's a somewhat unusual phenomenon. Um, the Victoria Police actually make decisions about how they're going to resource uh, uh, football matches based on which of the teams that are playing and, uh, and if there's a, a, exist or a historical conflict between the clubs. Okay. In 2011, there was a Serbian war criminal, uh, Ratko Mladic, uh, was jailed for, for war crimes committed uh, uh, during the Serbian-Bosnian conflict. Uh, 2011, Mladic was uh, remanded uh, in the Hague uh, uh, pending trial. Uh, Mladic uh, was also known as the uh, butcher of Srebrenica, and he was the Serbian army officer who was allegedly led the slaughter of, of thousands of, of uh, Muslims in Srebrenica. Um, this, this uh, massacre was, was touted as the most significant European, post-Nazi European massacre. Uh, you may think this is uh, far removed from the streets of, of Greater Danong in Australia, but uh, the reality is that uh, there is a community, community of uh, Serbian diaspora, including a tranche of some Serbian hardliners. Shortly after uh, Mladic was, uh, was jailed, there was a, there was a soccer match in Melbourne, and the so soccer match was between a uh, visiting Serbian team uh, and the Socceroos, which is uh, Australia's national team. Uh, the soccer match was in Melbourne's Etihad uh, Stadium, uh, it was well attended and it was uh, televised uh, nationally. At this soccer match, uh, uh, the banner that you see behind me was, uh, was unfurled. Uh, and the banner is a, a pro Mladic uh, banner calling for uh, his release. Uh, the, the banners were distasteful, uh, they were inappropriate, um, they included some, some symbolism of Serbian hardliners, um, and they incited conflict, which was probably the intention of the, the people who hung them. So uh, certainly during the, the event, uh, the, the banners were removed. So that very evening, the Albanian mosque in, in South Daninong was, was desecrated with a graffiti attack. The Greek graffiti included some pro-Mladic comments, Serbian symbolism, uh, and anti-Muslim comment. So although graffiti of itself is viewed as a fairly low-level crime, uh, the racial motivation of the offender was certainly, uh, offenders were certainly a concern for, for Victoria Police. So as a result, we, we put our crime, crime investigation unit to the task of uh, investigating the crime. Uh, the, the imam and uh, the Albanian community leaders were understandably distraught that their, their place of worship, uh, the place of prayer had been desecrated, uh, but they were uh, revolted that there was support for uh, a war criminal such as Mladic could exist uh, within our community in Daniel. Following evening, uh, the, the next evening, both the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Serbian Soccer Club uh, in Keysborough, in Greater Daninong, were damaged as a result of uh, petrol bomb attacks. So Molotov cocktails were thrown both at the church and the soccer club, causing some significant uh, damage. Uh, the priest, uh, Serbian Orthodox Chief, uh, priest, uh, Father Chetomir, certainly linked the attacks to the, the pro Mladic uh, banners as a, a retaliatory uh, attack. The level of seriousness of these, of these crimes against the Serbian site were obviously more significant and, and uh, we uh, put in additional resources for the investigation 
uh, and uh, uh, crime scene resources and also alerted our intelligence officers. So uh, as a police officer, I was certainly satisfied that the crimes were being appropriately investigated uh, with appropriate sort of resourcing. But as a peace officer, uh, I had deep concerns. Uh, this conflict was fast developing into uh, uh, an intractable conflict uh, with tit-for-tat offending. Uh, I had concerns there would be further property damage, uh, people injured and potentially people killed. So as a peace officer, I had to create some interventions to, to deal with this particular uh, conflict. Uh, resolving the conflict was not going to be achieved through police investigative processes. So what was the tool? What was the tool that I took out of the, the toolbox as, as, a, as a peace fellow, as a peace officer? So uh, William Urey uh, termed the, uh, the term uh, the third side. So I, I positioned myself as a third sider uh, in this particular conflict. So as a third sider, it was critical that, uh, to use Urey's language, that I stayed on the balcony uh, my first role was to not get involved in the conflict, not take uh, a side, uh, but to stay on the balcony and be the custodian of the, the peace process. So clearly the, the first task was to understand what the issue was. You can't manage what you don't understand. So a significant conflict analysis was, was the first step in, in dealing with this conflict. Second step was to, to start some dialogue with both the groups. And the starting uh, point was clearly the, uh, the religious leaders being the imam from the Albanian mosque and uh, the priest from the Serbian Orthodox Church. Both the leaders were open to exploring the opportunity uh, to resolve conflict. Um, and with their assistance, we're able to, to gather uh, the, uh, the peer group influences and the, the community leaders and elders uh, from both groups and, and commence some dialogue. Uh, certainly from commencing that dialogue, we were able to uh, establish the positions of, of both groups. Uh, thank you. Uh, it also provided us the opportunity to, to influence both groups to involved in a, a conflict resolution process. So as a peace officer, I had to understand my role as a custodian to re resolve or to custodian of, of the processes. Uh, and as a police officer, this is difficult because we tend to want to, to rush towards a solution and be very uh, solution focused. Uh, and after three decades of policing, it uh, is difficult to take that, uh, that sideways step. Uh, but my interest in a rapid outcome uh, held no currency. Uh, I had to involve the parties in the conflict and, and had to assist them work through a, a solution that the, both parties could, could own. So the process that we undertook was um, uh, dipping into the toolbox once again was uh, 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 interest-based bargaining process, which is uh, certainly uh, uh, well written in, in uh, the, the work by uh, Fisher and Yuri in uh, the book Getting to Yes. Um, so we, we arranged a negotiation between, between the two groups, which was the religious leaders uh, from both groups, the peer influencers and uh, uh, the elders, the authoritarian uh, leaders from, from uh, both communities. The negotiation took place uh, in the police station, which was uh, turned out to be uh, a good choice because uh, the, the location op offered a strategic advantage to, to me as the third sider. Uh, not only was it neutral ground, but uh, uh, the, the place, the building behoved uh, 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 good behaviour. So it reduced the, the table banging over uh, position and talking about uh, position was never going to get us anywhere. It would have just continued to churn the, the uh, historical uh, conflict. So uh, we were quickly able to, to move into discussing the interests of, of, of both parties. 
and it was a, a very interesting process to be, be part of. Uh, and the religious leaders both stepped up to the plate and saw this as a really, really unique opportunity and, and took, the, took the lead. And, uh, the conversation tended to uh, uh, slip away from a, a bargaining process to an uh, uh, interfaith dialogue. So throughout the process, we developed some, uh, some strategies. And uh, for example, it's a really simple strategy, but uh, we developed uh, a, a poster uh, with a police uh, letter on a police letterhead. And the poster was asking for assistance for the communities for, for both crimes. But uh, the, the poster showed the unity between the police, uh, the Serbian and the Albanian communities. And we hung those posters in uh, churches and other significant places. Uh, we used very similar language uh, at uh, community meetings on uh, community radio and ethno-specific uh, uh, newspapers and through community web networks. So it was, it was successful for us and uh, we had no further crimes between the, the, the two communities as a result of this conflict, but uh, significantly both, both communities identified that they had never sat together uh, in the same room uh, before. And they undertook to continue to sit together and to meet, to, to work through not only this conflict, but to be proactive about any future conflicts. So I actually felt that uh, as, as a peace officer, I had very, done very little. All I'd actually done was uh, created the space for something to happen, uh, and it did. So I mentioned the, the settling cultures in, in Greater Dandenong, and uh, cultures that uh, 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 communities that settle in Danong either, either remain or move away or, or uh, a combination of both. Many communities have uh, created cultural hubs in Greater Danong uh, and uh, certainly similarities when, when I've um, had the pleasure of, of moving around uh, within your community. Uh, so we have uh, Little India and <laughs> I had dinner in uh, the India Mile last night, <laughs> Curry Mile last night. So, uh, we also have uh, an Afghan quarter in Greater Dandenong. In Springvale, Springvale Road uh, in Greater Dandenong is the centre, and the, the images behind you are, are from Springvale Road. Uh, the, the road is uh, all, or predominantly all, uh, Vietnamese and Cambodian owned uh, businesses. And uh, the other example is Noble Park, which has become the, the centre of, of the African community. So um, it's interesting that uh, now uh, those, uh, those cultural hubs are actually uh, creating revenue for, for the city as, as, as uh, people external to the city now visit to have uh, culinary experiences. So, uh, pictured here is the, the book Do No Harm from, from Mary Anderson, which will become evident as, as I talk through the next couple of slides. But the settlement journey for uh, various cultures is, is vastly different. Some communities uh, establish and organise quickly, others, others don't. Uh, for many, uh, the settlement journey has been long and difficult. Uh, for many, third country settlement uh, is second best. Uh, and with a preference to uh, return to their native homelands, but uh, that may not be able to happen because of lack of peace, lack of opportunity, fear of persecution or, or a combination of factors. Many have spent uh, years or uh, decades in, in refugee camps waiting to return home and then choosing third country resettlement uh, as, uh, as second best. Uh, some have arrived as asylum seekers, uh, and these varying settlement journeys and motivations can impact on, on the, the settlement experience. And this is particularly pronounced among young people. Uh, young people from emerging communities uh, in Greater Danong may have spent some, most or all of their formative years in, in refugee camps with uh, limited or no opportunity for formal schooling. So upon third country uh, resettlement, 
In Australia, many are placed in the school system uh, based on their age and not their academic ability. Uh, many drop away from the schooling system, um, are unable to find employment, uh, become disengaged with uh, mainstream activity, uh, have uh, limited skills, uh, little or no employment uh, experience, uh, literacy and numeracy uh, issues. For a young person trying to transition into adulthood, trying to establish their, their own identity, this is, this is a, a fairly tough journey. Uh, many find their way onto the street, many find a like peer group among disengaged young people on the street, uh, begin to uh, establish their identity with such peers, peers which uh, may include uh, uh, a drug, alcohol, uh, and crime or a combination of all of those. One of the fast emerging communities in, in Danong uh, is the Sudanese community. Um, uh, the other communities for interest uh, are Afghan, uh, uh, a lot of Af Afghan arrivals at, at this point in time. Uh, some uh, Sri Lankan Tamils and, and we're starting to get uh, uh, Syrians arriving in, in Danong. But uh, in the, the mid-2000s, Greater Danong saw a proliferation in uh, risk-taking street behaviours with disengaged young people from uh, uh, South Sudan as the offending group. Uh, some top-end offenders, uh, so some top-end offences, which were sort of significant uh, uh, signposts, was. Uh, uh, the stabbing death of, of Dr. Maruf in, in her surgery in Keysborough in Greater Dandenong. Uh, there was uh, some top end uh, sexual assaults in 2007 with uh, uh, a young Sudanese man as, as the offender. It's interesting uh, when you look at the reporting on, on this particular issue and the, the reporting I suggest is, is somewhat uh, inflammatory, <laughs> starting off with a Sudanese refugee. Uh, so um, certainly I've had this conversation uh, about uh, managing media with, uh, with Arinma and uh, so there's these similar similarities with the impact of the press on, on fueling uh, uh, issues of conflict within the community. The next signpost was uh, the death of this young man, uh, Leip Goni, and uh, Leip was uh, bashed to death in a, a racially motivated uh, attack on uh, the Noble Park railway station in Greater Daniel. The initial police response uh, was very much uh, around uh, enforcement. And we, we started Operation uh, Sarasan, which is very focused on a, a high impact uh, policing, very visible uh, policing, using authoritative tools such as uh, uh, bail and police penalty notices, um, stop and search powers, uh, uh, quite a list of, of, of different tools that are available uh, for us. So this certainly had a uh, impact on the broader community who uh, the, the perceptions of safety improved because of, of the visible police presence, but uh, it didn't deal with the underpinning issues with the, with the young people. Uh, we had uh, um, assaults on police officers uh, and inevitably uh, allegations of racism. So, as a, uh, a peace officer, once again, we had to turn our minds to how we could deal with uh, resolving the underpinning conflict. And this particular photo was taken on the streets of Noble Park shortly after the death of, of Leit Goni. And I, I think um, this photo uh, says a lot. Uh, you see the faces on, on those young people. And I remember seeing this photo and being uh, very much driven to action uh, because of, of the looks on, on those faces. So, 
we developed a, a suite of projects and, and interventions. And uh, the first was to create a mechanism for dialogue with the the authoritative uh, leaders from the community, so the uh, community elders. We established this document. You don't have to try and read this document, <laughs> uh, but we called it a local level agreement. It was just a, a, a written formal agreement that we would engage in dialogue. Uh, and the, uh, the signatories were myself as, as the local area commander uh, and the, the president of the South Sudanese Association in Australia. So it, uh, we could use it as a vehicle, a springboard, to, to launch uh, conversations, whether it was uh, reactively in response to an issue or, or proactively to, to plan specific uh, events. And we used it, it has become our, our uh, regular mode of, of operation. Some, some examples of when we enacted this uh, local level agreement was a uh, response to a anti-African racially motivated fly flyer which was uh, produced by a white sup supremacist, can't even say that word, in a group in Frankston, Victoria. And they were posting these, these posters on uh, lamp posts and windscreens uh, uh, in cars in the Frankston area. Uh, we also used it when we were planning for the South Sudanese beauty pageant, uh, surprisingly. But the beauty pageant had been a, uh, an event that experienced some significant public order issues in, in previous years. Uh, we enacted it uh, for the investigation in the victim care after a young Sudanese man uh, died on the streets in a public brawl at uh, the Danong Plaza. Uh, we also used it uh, for victim care and information sharing after the death of a young Sudanese man uh, which resulted after a, a police chase of a, a stolen vehicle. Suit of Youth Outreach Program. We had to uh, establish a, a vehicle to re-engage uh, disengaged young people. And I'd need to uh, acknowledge the, the project partner, WISAS, and you'll, you'll see their acronym in, in the corner. Uh, there, so I just acknowledge their, their IP for this slide. So the Assertive Youth Out, Outreach Program was uh, an engagement project. Uh, it was somewhat, or was very unique, in that uh, it was uh, youth workers funded by uh, Victoria Police in partnership with the Office of uh, Multicultural Affairs and Citizenship, OMAC, uh, and also the City of Greater Denon. Uh We formed a, a partnership with, uh, with WISAS as the service provider and funded two outreach workers. And these were assertive outreach workers. I'm not talking about outreach workers in an office uh, between nine to five waiting for people to come to the, the door because um, disengaged people are disengaged. So, uh, so we had our, our outreach workers uh, on the street uh, wearing out shoe leather two, three o'clock in the morning uh, when they were needed. The, the, their focus was to, to connect with the young people, start conversations, uh, build trust with uh, uh, young people, start to identify what were some of the underpinning issues, whether it was drug, alcohol abuse, or family violence, uh, sexual assault, uh, or as simple as um, a lack of food, and shelter, and wound care. So it's a very successful uh, project for us, and you can see our two youth workers there, uh, Kat Lawak and uh, Andrew, were very enthusiastic about this, um, uh, their role. Uh, they, uh, the program ran for some two years, and they had uh, uh, thousands of contacts over that uh, two-year period, but contacts that converted into to actual uh, uh, casework. I guess where, where this was very unique, because <laughs> uh, the youth work approach and police uh, approaches uh, could be viewed as somewhat different uh, and opposite poles, but uh, this was bringing together the two to the point where we had the youth workers outposted uh, at uh, police stations. So Gat and Andrew would start, uh, start their shift at the Danong police station or the Springvale police station, talking to cops, talking about uh, uh, where things were happening, whether it was um, you know, uh, kids chroming, uh, Pacific Islanders chroming in, in Copas Park or, or uh, young Sudanese uh, drinking behind a garage.
Uh, the program, as I said, was, was very successful. We had an independent uh, review of the, uh, the program by Melbourne University and uh, they're quite excited by the model and it was uh, recognised with some uh, drug and alcohol awards. Uh, the next program was uh, a development uh, uh, project and this was the uh, Sudanese Youth Leadership uh, Development Program and you'll probably see a familiar, familiar face or two familiar faces in amongst uh, uh, this particular slide. So. We understood that uh, the Sudanese community elders are certainly the stalwarts of, uh, of the community, providing uh, that sort of authoritative uh, leadership as, as community elders. But uh, police and community agencies realised that we also needed to develop youth leaders. Uh, we identified that there was uh, intergenerational conflict between the authoritative leaders uh, and uh, uh, particularly the disengaged young who no longer recognise that authoritative leadership of, of, of the elders. So we wanted to develop a, a group of young leaders who still had influence uh, over, over the younger community. The Identifying the leaders was, was the first challenge and uh, we did this uh, through sport. Uh, we identified that uh, uh, Sudanese young men had uh, arranged some informal soccer clubs uh, which included a, a soccer fixture. So certainly that needed a level of organisation to, to occur. So we want to identify who were the, uh, the leaders who were driving those, those soccer clubs. We did this by attending their games and uh, uh, attending their training sessions. <laughs> There's a great anecdote by uh, a couple of the boys uh, where they couldn't understand why the cops were hanging around at uh, uh, their training sessions, so they decided to stay on the field until the, uh, the police disappeared. But uh, it got to about 10.30 at night and they were just about ready to drop. Uh, they were, it was uh, dark and they were cold and hungry, so they eventually came off the field and had to engage with us. But, uh, so over a period of time we, we built uh, uh, trust and identified the young leaders and uh, and started our first, first group of uh, Sudanese young leaders. So a fantastic group and Rotary were one of the partners in uh, this project and, and Rotary assisted in uh, uh, bringing a RIMA over to, to commence the, the project and, or pr commence the, the program. And uh, a RIMA's role was to switch on uh, these guys, switch on the idea of, of uh, uh, active citizenship and uh, Arima achieved this by simply telling her story and telling the story of, of Mossai which was really powerful uh, storytelling that had a, a fantastic impact on, on these young men. So uh, from an outcome perspective um, out of this first, first group I can, I can happily say that all of them uh, are now uh, employed or returned to uh, formal education. Um, Tito Agut, uh, one of the men that was pictured there, uh, presented with me the parliament, a parliamentary inquiry uh, into community safety and uh, Tito is also actively seeking employment with, uh, with Victoria Police. And I have to say that this was never an intended uh, outcome of, of the program but it, it is significant because certainly when an emerging community makes a decision to choose uh, policing as a, as a career, it's a six, six significant signpost in the, in the settlement journey. Mackay Ayon. Uh, Mackay was uh, interviewed by a documentary filmmaker who was preparing a documentary on good human rights practice. Um, uh, David Jard, another one of the men who was probably uh, the most uh, impressive leader of this group, uh, was also in interviewed by our ABC Late Line program. And Mackay now sits at the table uh, under that local level, level agreement as a recognised uh, community elder at the tender age of, of 26. Sports inclusion. So I've, I've uh, mentioned, on, I mentioned soccer as uh, one of the springboards, but uh, certainly sports inclusion projects have, have been uh, very successful for us, and I have to admit that to the Greater Dandenong Boxing Club uh, is uh, my hobby horse, and I held the presidency at uh, the boxing club uh, for a number of years. So the the boxing club in South Dandenong uh, is pitched at providing uh, it's not pitched at training 
fighters. It's pitched at providing opportunity for uh, young people to train and uh, develop uh, their skills. We have a, a membership of some 150 people. Uh, the prominent uh, ethnicity is, is Afghan. About 55% uh, of the club uh, is, is Afghan. But um, it provides uh, the opportunity for skills development uh, in a rules-driven environment, uh, which is unusual because some of the participants haven't had to operate in a, in a rules-driven uh, environment, but uh, to remain with the club and to train in the club, they have to adhere by our, our rules, which are, are very safety-focused. Um, but it's very rewarding. It's, it's run by uh, the police as well as uh, community members, uh, all volunteers. Uh, the, uh, the, the outcome is, or the unintended, or it is an intended outcome, but uh, the, the mentoring relationships that develop uh, at the club are, are significant. So hanging onto a set of boxing uh, gloves and, and catching punches from, from young people and, and uh, building that trust and starting the relationships and, uh, and issues start to come out that you can uh, address as, uh, as, a, as a mentor to that uh, uh, young person. So uh, <laughs> it's a uh, commonly uh, said in Greater Dandenong, if, if you want the charm, opportunity to have a, a free punch at a copper uh, without getting the strife, come to the boxing club. But <laughs> uh, we don't mind that talk, because if that gets young people through the door, well, uh, that's a good outcome. Mount Feathertop uh, Youth Challenge. This is a, another YSAS uh, initiative that, uh, that we assist with. And, uh, this is an interesting one. It, it resulted uh, as a result, it resulted uh, because a, 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 one of our MPs actually got lost walking up to, to Mount Feathertop, and we saw that as an opportunity uh, to, uh, to launch a, a new challenge. So uh, we take, uh, every year we take a, a group of uh, young people from our community up to the top of Mount uh, Feathertop, and this particular MP joins us it's every year. And Mount Feathertop's the second highest peak uh, in Victoria, and another good example of sports inclusion. Okay. So, I actually don't know who this guy is, uh, but uh, I found this image on, on Google, and uh, I, I thought, uh, that's a, a, a pleasing face and much better than the faces you saw in that Noble Park photo uh, post-death of, of Lee Goney. So the, the work that I've discussed is, is, is very much uh, grassroots work uh, at the community uh, level. Uh, but I suggest to you that is where uh, uh, peace starts. Uh, all the pol policy in the world will, will have no effect uh, unless there's some personal commitment and some community commitment to, to peace processes. Uh, certainly peace is, is ongoing work. It would be nice to be able to, to get to the point of uh, resolution, sit uh, back in an armchair and, and celebrate that, that, that uh, peace is done. Uh, but I suggest to you that this is not going to happen. Uh, the work of peace practitioners is, is certainly never done. Uh, it takes ongoing vigilance to identify, analyse and react to the next convict conflict. Um, I, I've discussed my peace work in Greater Dandenong using uh, examples of, of inter and intra uh, racial conflicts, uh, uh, but I could have equally used examples of, of family violence or, or bullying. The, and as I said, uh, as, uh, as, we're, as we're here, uh, there's uh, new emerging communities in, in Greater Dandenong with the Sri Lankan uh, Tamils uh, and uh, Syrians and Iranians also. So uh, there is always uh, new issues to turn in mind to. Uh, a cynic may suggest that uh, peace is, is not achievable. There will always be another conflict at either com uh, community or, or national level. Uh, therefore, there is no point to peace endeavours. Well, I'd probably agree with the cynic in that there will always be another conflict at either community or, or national level. But um, I would certainly disagree uh, with the, the second proposal. Uh, peace is an ideal that should be implicit in our value set and to not strive for peace, regardless of the endlessness of the endeavour, uh, I suggest is the domain of uh, the morally inept. Thank you.